So time for the press preview then. It's our first look at the front pages as they come into us here at Sky. It's time to see what's making those headlines with the Daily Express columnist and broadcaster Carol Malone here in the studio and the Belfast Telegraph columnist Alison Morris who joins us uh, down the line. Evening Alison and Yay. evening Carol. Great to Hello. see you in the studio. <laughs> uh, let's see what's on some of those front pages then, shall we? We're coming for you, Vlad reads the front of the Metro, as supporters of the Putin critic Yevgeny Prigozhin vow revenge over his apparent death in a plane crash. The FT highlights the Russian president breaking his silence on the matter to confirm that Mr Prigozhin is dead. The eye splashes with a picture of his plane wreckage. The paper says he'll be replaced within Wagner by the same commander responsible for the Salisbury poisonings. The US intelligence services believe a bomb was the cause of the plane crash. That's the lead for The Guardian. The Daily Mail refers to Putin's TV address as a chilling taunt, while The Sun makes no secret of who it believes was behind Prigozhin's plane crash. The jump in asylum spending is the top story for The Express, with Rishi Sunak saying that £4 billion is an unacceptable price tag. An exclusive for the Mirror, it says Pakistani police are close to finding the father of 10-year-old girl Sara Sharif. Uh, he reportedly fled to Pakistan after she was found dead at her home. And the curse of the spooky child, which is seeing shoppers continuously return a painting to a charity shop, is the focal point of the star. I want to read more about that. And uh, don't forget, by scanning the QR code you see on screen uh, throughout the programme, you can have a look at the front pages uh, of tomorrow's papers while you watch us discussing them. And I'm joined by Carol Malone and Alison Morris. Great. Well, let's get cracking, shall we? Um, Alison, why don't we come to you first, having a look at the front page of The Eye, uh, the news that broke uh, only a couple of hours ago or so that uh, the Pentagon believes that uh, this plane was actually blown up mid-air. It wasn't a surface-to-air missile. Yeah, and you can see there's footage of the of the plane coming down, or what people say is the plane coming down, and it looks as though it has been an explosion mid-air, and it also seems very deliberate that it happened where it did. You know, um, I was reading earlier that these planes are incredibly reliable, that in its history of this particular aircraft, there's only ever been one incident um, where the plane's uh, mechanisms failed and then it was landed safely anyway. So for this uh, plane to fail, I think most people ruled that out pretty quickly. It seems that this was very deliberate, but by the, the look of what had happened, it seemed to almost implode mid-air, which makes it uh, make more sense that somebody carried a bomb or placed a bomb upon that plane, which was detonated at a certain point, rather than a, a surface during missile, which experts have said would have left a trail and would have been more easily identified. Um, had that been the way that he was killed. But um, it's just been, it's an interesting day. I've been glued to the coverage all day. The, the statement by Putin, I thought, was very telling. Mm. Um, he, Although he sent sympathies, he also admitted that he had um, known Prigozhin since the 1990s. And in previous interviews, he hasn't even admitted that we're friends. Um, but it really is, a, you know, if you're going to come for the king, you better not miss. And the, th the fact is that he tried to stage a rebellion earlier this year. It was unsuccessful. And I think most people were of the opinion it was only a matter of time before Putin tried to seek his revenge. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're right to say that um, we, we've sort of been glued to the coverage because, Carol, there have been so many twists and turns oh, God, in yeah. this. In the last 24 yeah. hours, the latest being about uh, US intelligence saying that uh, it seems like it was an explosion on board. Mm. And also, as Alison was saying, in front of the Daily Mail, uh, talking about Putin's, well, they call it a chilling taunt over his rival's mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure it's a taunt, but it is the height of, of hypocrisy to apologise to the family of the bloke It looks like he's just blown out the air with, with nine other people. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, the, but the thing is, you know, he, Prigozhin was always dead man walking. Everyone knew that after, you know, his march on the on the Kremlin, ba Kremlin back in June, he was going to be dead man walking. He would be insane not to think that was the case. Um, and, you know, Putin did say at the time, his words were, um, mutineers will be punished, traitors will be held to account. And, and, you know, a lot of people at that time were then seeing... Putin is weak because of the march of the of the Wagner, because they looked like they were going to march on on Moscow. So so people were wondering if 
if he would make good on the bluster. And, of course, he had to do this. I mean, you know, for him to retain control in Russia, he had to do this, to be seen to be the strong leader. And, of course, he has. And it's... it's you know, it, it seems incredible to me that Prigozhin was like, he was dotting around on this plane all of the time. I mean, you know, I think there was a CIA official said a couple of months ago, um, if, I, if I was Prigozhin, I wouldn't sack me food tester, but there are other ways to kill people. And, and clearly, if the guy is flying around all the time, this is one of the ways. And, and US intelligence services, and I say, there might not have been one bomb on board, there might have been two bombs on board. And, and there was a, an interesting moment today where they were saying the, boat, the, the plane didn't take off because it was having things done to it before it took off, it had some fault or something. Maybe that, that was the moment it was put on, who knows? But, um, you know, this guy, actually, well, let's go to the, the I headline, which is one of the papers that I, and it says, we're coming from you. And that's the Wagner group saying mm. they have now vowed to avenge this. You know, they know Putin did it. They believe it was a on a direct order from Putin. And, and I think, you know, it, I was thinking about this and I was thinking, although this in the short term makes Putin look good and strong, in the long term, if this Wagner group is going to pursue him, I mean, this is going to be very dangerous. He's going to be in the same situation he was back in June, yeah, yeah. only the people are angrier now mm, mm. Because, because he's killed their hero. Well, so let's put that to Alison then, just looking at the front of The Guardian, uh, also reflecting the US uh, saying that the bomb was most likely the, uh, uh, of the explosion of that aircraft, actually potentially weakened if it's really riled up the, uh, the other mercenaries. Well, there, there's a number of things. Um, Wagner's troops are, you know, they're incredibly loyal to their leadership because mm -hmm. they were much better armed than the Russian army, but they were also much better taken care of. So we had all those reports of food shortages at the front line, of ammunition shortages, of vehicle shortages. Those troops, those mercenaries, they were incredibly well armed, they were incredibly well looked after, and so therefore very loyal obviously, to Prigozhin and the rest of the leadership of the Wagner Group. Also remember the amount of money that this group was generating. They're also involved in sending mercenaries to places like Syria, to Central Africa, to other countries. And that's in, that is all done in exchange for mining rights in terms of diamonds and all sorts of other um, natural resources which are worth vast sums of money. And that's how this was being funded. So how do you replace that? And the fact is that it was a big loss to Putin when he did lose that loyalty from the Wagner group. Is he going to be able to bring those mercenaries back on board and make them loyal to him? I don't think so. But also it would be a very brave or possibly stupid person who would go against Putin now knowing what has happened. But he he was he was weakened by this rebellion mm -hmm. um, earlier this year. I think that he has maybe shown his strength in the short term. But how does he replace that massive, massive group, thousands of troops, well-armed, very well-trained, loyal troops. How does he replace them in terms of the Ukraine war? He relied on them so heavily. Mm. He now doesn't have them in the reports that the, the um, camp that 8,000 um, Wagner troops were camped out in outside of Belarus is now being dismantled. Where are those people going? Are they taking themselves off to work as mercenaries otherwhere in the world where they're in great demand? Or are they staying around maybe to take another challenge at the Kremlin? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, it, see, it seems like they might, because one of the one of the statements today, Alison, was that they said they're planning full mobilization. So they could well be doing it. But you know, what doesn't this make you think what a disaster the the unprovoked attack on Ukraine mm. was 18 mm. months ago? Because all of this has stemmed from that. Putin would have kept his power, it would have kept this illusion of, you know, you know, being, you know, being this great leader. He made a massive mistake in invading Ukraine, and, and everything that has, all the things that have happened since, have, have stemmed from that. And, and, and it just it makes you think he's kind of lost his touch, I think. And, but yeah, interesting, some of your reports tonight, it showed you the, uh, the, the way interviewing some, some Russians, and, and they were all saying, oh, he's been framed, he's been framed. It's incredible the loyalty that some Russians have mm. uh, for Putin. But I, but I think a lot of people are beginning to see through him now. It's, it's, uh, I, I think he's weakened, and I don't think it's going to be long before there's going to be a new leader. Yeah, uh, well, let's finish with the front of the sun, um, oh, because yes. they've done a, a, a mock... Uh, sympathy card. It says, Alison, with deepest sympathy, so sorry 
uh, I killed him. Um, and, of course, there are still many um, unanswered questions with regard to, to all of this. Um, uh, one of them, which has been asked today uh, by uh, various analysts, um, is why would Prigozhin be on board this plane with his right-hand man, yeah. plus the man in charge of all his finances? They were obsessed and paranoid about their own safety and security, and yet they were all bundled together on the same aircraft. It seems uh, impossible. Yeah, and I think that's where we're getting the conspiracy theorists to say, was this a stage death? Is he actually still alive? Did he plan this himself, knowing full well that this plane was going to go down? And then that would be his excuse to maybe take himself off to one of those other countries and regroup. Um, but in, in terms of that, also, you would wonder where were the safety um, mechanisms in place? I mean, a man like this, he's, a, you know, probably one of the most well-known warlords in the world. This person has feared, you know, the globe over. Why wasn't he checking and rechecking and having his own checks done on that plane before they got on board? You know, all of all of that, I suppose, fades into it. And then, as Carl said, you know, Putin is, has been, been weakened greatly by the Ukrainian invasion. I was in... Russia visited Moscow uh, quite a few years ago. And at that stage, you could say there was, you know, cult-like adoration of Putin. Now I wonder, has that changed to more of a fear of speaking out against their leader mm -hmm. rather than a loyalty? Because the war and taking, you know, people's fathers and sons off and sending them off to a war that doesn't seem to um, ever going to have any end to it has clearly weakened them in terms of that loyalty. But yeah. by doing things like this, it instills fear in people, so then they're afraid to speak out. Yes. Hello again. Welcome back. Carol and Alison are still with us. Part two of the press preview. Uh, let's turn our attention, Carol, to the front of the Daily Express. Yeah. The Prime Minister saying yeah. that uh, in order to bring that £4 billion uh, cost down, uh, we need to stop the boats in the first place. Which is <laughs> wow. There's, there's something he hasn't said before, like only every day for the last however many months. Yeah, yeah, yeah the thing is with Sunak, you know, I do like him and I, and I think he's a half-decent Prime Minister, but he's got stop saying this because he's not doing the two things that will stop the boats. One of them is to leave the ECHR and the other thing is to turn the boats back. And he's not going to do either of them. And I don't quite know how, he's, how he thinks he's going to do this, especially when we have a Home Office that is... That is the backlog, I mean, there, there, there's another story that talked about the backlog of people waiting to be processed. I mean, you know, the, it says that they've clear, that more than 75,000 people are waiting for a decision on whether they will be granted refugee status. That's up from 44% last mm. year. So, you know, we have a Home Office that's processing, at, you know, not what they should. And if you remember Sunak said last year, he would have the backlog cleared by December. That's just not going to happen. But very quickly, when you say turn the boats back, how, how, how do you physically do that? Well, you can't. Well, you can. you can. You can do what Australia did. You can do what the Australian Prime Minister did. And he just, he just turned them around and led them back. And, and, but the French are saying that you can't do that because it's dangerous. Well, it's no more dangerous than coming over. But you saw what happened today. There was a, there was a, there was a, a load of people in a dinghy. It was very unsafe. Half of them didn't have life jackets. But the people... And, and the French rescue boats were there, but the people in the boats wouldn't go into the French rescue boat. They wanted to get into British waters where they knew they'd be brought ashore. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's happening every single day. And the French are half-heartedly um, trying to, to stop it. They're not really trying to stop. We're paying them multi. Well, we are giving them. We've given them a lot more money. A lot more money. A question and, about and uh, nothing. They're not. Um, Carol, we are a bit short of time, so I'm going go. to ask Alison for your thoughts on this one. Look, I mean, I, I just find it really distressing seeing people, um, you know, going to their death in, in boats. And, you know, I visited refugee camps a few years ago and I always remember it said on the wall, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And I always think how desperate you'd have to be to get in one of those dinghies in the first place. I think Carl has a point in terms of trying to speed up that process. There are people seeking asylum who could be working, who could be, you know, giving something back to the country that they want to make their new home in. And instead, they're being put up at ho in hotels at the taxpayers' expense. They're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to contribute to society. So speed up those applications. Get rid of, make, make it a quicker and swifter process to get rid of people and deport them back who aren't uh, asylum seekers, who aren't refugees, and make sure the people who are refugees, who are fleeing persecution, are given a, a quick passage into giving uh, um, some sort of asylum and allowed to go to work and allowed to contribute um, and allowed to look after their families instead of sitting around waiting on handouts, which is then 
what turns the public against them, I think, mm -hmm. when they see people who aren't working. But the fact is that they can't work because the process doesn't allow them to. OK, uh, let's finish with a story in the Metro. Uh, Carol, uh, it's a victory for Lionesses fan. Nike scored an own goal, didn't they, when it yeah. came to these yeah. shirts uh, of Mary Earps? But yeah, they've they, done a U-turn. They, they, they've, they've finally done a U-turn and they've, they've very grandly announced they're going to make a limited amount of Mary Earps shirts. I don't know why they're making a limited amount. This girl is the best female goalkeeper in the world. She's she's FIFA's top she's FIFA's top goalkeeper. She's a European champion and, and she's really upset about this. I and mean, there's a piece I read today where she says she's actually hurt by it. She said, you know, imagine the little kids asking for a, a Mary Earp shirt and Nike saying we're not doing it. And Nike should be ashamed because they promote themselves as a front runner in women's sport. And They've obviously got something against women, and especially Mary Earp. They could be making shed loads of money from this, and I don't quite understand why they're not. Yeah. Alison, very quick thought from you on this. Yeah. Well, they make shirts with mediocre male footballers' names on the back exactly. of them, but can't make shirts <laughs> with one of the best female goalkeepers or the best female goalkeeper in the world. Yeah, yeah she'd even offered to uh, to pay for the shirts herself. I couldn't believe that. And it that. led to that huge online it's, petition. It's... Um, thank you both very much. We should...